Friends, what an exciting evening. Um, I'm Ken Bamberger. I'm the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Professor of Law uh, here at UC Berkeley. And I'm one of the two co-faculty directors of the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. And I want to extend a hearty and warm and loving welcome to the Helen Diller Institute's annual Robbins Collection Lecture on Jewish Law, Thought, and Identity tonight with Yuda Kurtzer, the president of the Shalom Hartman Institute. And he'll be speaking, is better? He'll be speaking about our golden age, American Judaism in transition. Um, I'll, my first sentence about who I was will have to remain a mystery uh, for those not sitting in the front row. Um, we are on an extraordinary campus at an extraordinary law school, uh, a place where we are privileged to be able to engage in discourse. And free speech and academic freedom are foundational values for UC Berkeley. The university is committed to the belief, the knowledge, that speech we might not like or agree with should be confronted with respectful speech rather than censorship. And UC Berkeley's principles of community call for civility and respect in all of our personal interactions. So if anyone here tonight would like to express a point of view that's different from what our guest presents this evening, we encourage you. You may do so in any area on campus that's open to public free speech. You, of course, may ask questions at the appropriate time tonight. However, no one is permitted to disrupt the event. We ask that everyone as audience members be respectful of the speaker and the students in attendance and refrain from any disruptive behavior. And if someone attempts to disrupt the event, they'll be asked to leave the venue and face disciplinary student, student disciplinary action. Now that that's out of the way, um, the Distinguished Annual Robbins Collection Lecture on Jewish Law, Thought, and Identity has been a partnership between the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies and the Robbins Collection and Research Center, both dynamic centers at Berkeley Law since 2010. Together, the centers have brought dynamic speakers to discuss critical topics within contemporary Jewish thought. Uh, many of you have been here as through the years we've heard from uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs and Michael Walzer, and Suzanne Stone, and Moshe Halbertal, and Susanna Heschel, many others. Um, today's lecture marks the 15th year of this special collaboration. And the Robbins Collection has been instrumental in the Helen Diller Institute's success since its beginning. As an institute nurturing both a program in Israel studies and a program in Jewish law, thought, and identity, it's awesome to share space, which we literally do, with this rich collection of religious law manuscripts, including those of Jewish philosophers and legal thinkers. And I'm so grateful to all of our partners at the Robbins Collection. Professor Laurent Mayali, Laurent, are you here yet? OK, uh, uh, we'll clap for you in any way. And then when we see you, we'll thank you. Emily Best, Jenny Nelson, Patricia Castaneda, Jesse Sherwood, Caitlin Keller, and all of the Robbins faculty and staff. Um, the Helen Diller Institute provides a rich academic forum, forum for our nation's future leaders, our students on campus. This is, I don't need to tell you, a complicated time on campus. Polarization is more severe than ever. 
and it's particularly challenging for our students. As in all moments, Berkeley students want to engage meaningfully and constructively on the big issues of the day, and this includes American Judaism, the future of Israel, and much more. And they and our faculty want to do that in dynamic spaces where students and scholars and the wider community can exchange ideas thoughtfully, vigorously, and respectfully. The Helen Diller Institute exists to make that happen. In the current heated climate, civil discourse and the robust student support and mentorship we offer are not just important intellectual exercises. They are critical for educating informed and effective leaders for tomorrow, and they're essential to maintaining the health of our Berkeley campus. The Helen Diller Institute, our network of engaged faculty from across campus, and our amazing staff provide deep support and engagement and mentorship to hundreds of students a year. We bring seven to 10 visiting faculty and scholars to Berkeley. We sponsor courses in a dozen departments across campus. We coordinate public, academic, and student programs. We host an undergraduate fellows program, experiential learning programs in Israel, and it was announced just two weeks ago, we will launch an Israel Studies minor at UC Berkeley beginning in fall 2024. <laughs> it's really great, isn't it? It's amazing. Upcoming spring programs at the Helen Diller Institute provide a little sample of the breadth of programming that we bring to campus. So on April 10th, we'll host a webinar on sexual and gender-based violence on and after October 7th with Kohav El Kayam Levy of Hebrew University. Um, she just won two weeks ago the Israel Prize in the category of mutual responsibility. Um, and on April 15th, we'll host a webinar with Haifa University professor Eman Akbaria on the impact of the Israel-Hamas war on the Arab-Palestinian-Israeli community and implications for shared society work. And this is part two of a webinar series examining the Arab-Palestinian-Israeli experience in wartime from social, political, legal, and environmental perspectives. Lastly, on the evening of April 15th, we'll host author and Shalom Hartman Institute senior fellow Yossi Klein-Halevi in person here on campus in conversation with professor of history Ethan Katz, chair of the Jewish Studies program, discussing debates over Zionism and the future of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. All of our programs, everything, is enabled entirely by philanthropic support. So we're grateful to all of our supporters, to the supporters in the community who are here today. Thank you for your partnership. We encourage you to continue this partnership it has never been more important. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Dr. Yuda Kurtzer as our distinguished Robbins Collection lecturer. Before I introduce Yehuda formally, I want to express my joy over the thriving collaborations we have had with the Shalom Hartman Institute over the past six years especially in programming, in thought partnering, and particularly, particularly in bringing visiting faculty to teach at the Helen Diller Institute while that faculty is simultaneously affiliated as a Shalom Hartman Institute scholar in residence. And we're extremely grateful to the Corette Foundation for supporting this collaborative initiative that brought Professor Tomer Persico to campus for three years and has now brought Professor Masuas Sagiv, who we're ecstatic will be teaching on the Berkeley campus for one more year. Yuda Kurtzer is president of the Shalom Hartman Institute. 
He's a leading thinker and author on Jewish history and Jewish memory, on leadership and change in American Jewish life, the meaning of Israel to American Jews. And he's also a dear friend of mine, of my wife Sarah and our family. He's an incredible thought partner. He's an amazing and dedicated foodie. <laughs> and he's a very talented teacher. Dozens of our undergraduates and law students had the opportunity to learn with him earlier today at lunch. And I'll say he's probably the most talented Jewish leader and thinker today in, to use Berkeley language, seeing around corners, identifying the next challenges and the next opportunities, and engaging thoughtfully and dynamically about what they mean for Judaism and for Jewish identity. Yehuda led the creation of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America in 2010, looking around corners, as a pioneering research and educational center. He teaches in its many platforms for rabbis, academics, lay leaders, Jewish professionals, and leaders of other faith communities. And he's the host of Hartman's Identity Slash Crisis podcast. He can tell you how to pronounce that, Identity Crisis, on which he recently hosted my colleague uh, and hero, Professor Ron Hasner, the co-director <laughs> of the Helen Diller Institute. I recommend the podcast to you. Yehuda received his doctorate in Jewish studies from Harvard University and an MA in religion from Brown. He's an alumnus of both the Bronfman Youth and Wexner Graduate Fellowships, and he previously served as faculty member at Brandeis University, where he held the inaugural chair in Jewish communal innovation. He's the author of Shuva, The Future of the Jewish Past, which offers new thinking into uh, uh, navigating the tensions between history and memory. He's the co-editor of the New Jewish Canon, a collection of the most significant Jewish ideas and debates over the past two generations. And he lives in New York with his wife, Stephanie Ives, and their three children. And we are so happy to have him here in Berkeley. Please welcome you to Kurtzer. So first of all, thank you. Ken for that kind and warm introduction. Thank you to Ron as well, the other faculty co-director of the Helen Dare Institute. Thank you to Rebecca, the executive director, for making all of this possible. To our friends at the Caret Foundation who enabled the partnership over these years between the Hartman Institute and the Helen Diller Institute. And um, I'm, I'm really so incredibly honored to be here and I feel that on a few levels. One, just to be the Robbins lecturer this year is an extraordinary honor. But also, the Hartman Institute has been in this community for over a dozen years. Tonight feels like a, a late version of our bar mitzvah. We have so many friends and colleagues here, uh, colleagues of ours from the Hartman Institute and board members and a few former staff members of the Hartman Institute. Uh, it's, it's an exciting moment uh, and a pivotal moment for American Jewry. There's going to be a time in Jewish history in the distant future when hopefully Jewish history outlives all of us as it always does and when scholars and maybe our descendants and maybe if we are fortunate that our descendants are scholars, when they will ask the question, what did American Jews give to Judaism and the Jewish people? What was the great contribution that American Jews made to the history of Judaism. Now hopefully when our descendants and those scholars ask that question, hopefully they will still be here. Hopefully also scholars in the future will be better curators of their past than some of our ancestors who gave to us the history and the texts and the ideas of some great diaspora Jewish communities that made all sorts of tendentious and complicated choices of what parts of the Jewish past they were gonna actually yield to the present. Some Jewish communities live on in history 
and some are forgotten. Maybe it's because those Jewish communities won, or maybe because our ancestors who preserved the past had their biases about which communities were worth preserving. Nevertheless, we in the present have inherited from our past so many magnificent gems from ancient Jewish communities, books and texts, ideas and adaptations, we can point to the great contribution that Babylonian Jewry gave us, or the Golden Age of Spain, or many other diaspora Jewish communities. In fact, the most extraordinary thing that Jews have done throughout history, the unique contribution in and of itself to history, is the capacity to evolve and adapt what it means to be Jewish throughout all of the twists and turns and tribulations of, of the history of our people. The fact that our people have migrated to every civilization and through every civilization on earth, speaking different languages, believing different things, and somehow yielding some lessons of each Jewish community that would enable to be the composite of what we have inherited in the present. Sometimes we're fortunate to even see the seams of what we've inherited. Characters like Maimonides, who transforms the history of Judaism through his writing, you can see that Judaism was not the same after the moment of Maimonides that it was before. And so I want to ask, when our descendants or scholars look back and ask, what will have been our contribution? What did we, American Jews, do here that could only have developed here? that changed Judaism and Jewish history permanently. I hope you'll forgive me, even in the context of a secular university, that I'm gonna to speak tonight in the language of we. It's because I speak both professionally and not dispassionately about the history of Jews in America and the moment that we're in. I hope it doesn't make me incapable of assessing these questions objectively, but also signals how personally some of these topics affect me and many of us in the room. What will have been our contribution to the history of Judaism? Or maybe that's not a question that can wait for our descendants or scholars in the future to have to ask. Maybe the pressure and the urgency of the moment requires of us to ask this question ourselves today. What story are we American Jews in the active process of writing? Now you could ask this question comparatively as Jews often do. One of the ways that Jews sometimes look at the present and try to make sense of it is that you ask, what does this look like that I've seen before? <laughs> How do I assess the present? Well, sometimes I look for some analogy to a different version of the Jewish past, and it helps me understand the present. So for a long time, earlier in my career, I spent a lot of time thinking about how all of the ways in which the American Jewish community reminded me of the ancient Jewish community of Alexandria. It's really interesting. There's really interesting parallels. It's one of the great Jewish communities in history, dominated by a, by a people who could not read Jewish texts in the original and were unashamed by it, who actually produced incredible Jewish literature, including a 22-volume commentary on the Bible written by Jews who couldn't read Hebrew. There was amazing analogies to the political and public identity of Jews in ancient Alexandria that may not have made sense to most Jews between the period when that Jewish community was destroyed in the second century CE and now, but where I, as an American Jew in the 21st century, started to notice the similarities to this moment in the past. It's suggestive to think that one way to understand the present is to look for analogies to the past, but I ultimately felt that it was kind of hollow. So what? So what if this Jewish community looks like an ancient Jewish community from 2,000 years ago that nobody else remembers? That doesn't feel like a great legacy that we would want to use to assess our present. But what's worse than that is it also sometimes leads people to believe that if I'm making an analogy between the present and the past to understand the present, that I'm also borrowing from that analogy some sort of predictor about what's going to happen to that Jewish community. And as every other ancient diaspora Jewish community was once destroyed, sometimes making an analogy to other past Jewish communities makes us depressed by the possibility, the likelihood, that the same thing will happen to us as happened to them. I'll talk later on about the idea that American Jews 
built a Jewish community experiencing more affluence, influence, power, and privilege than any other Jewish community in history. But every time I say that, somebody comes along and says, didn't Jews believe that about themselves in early 30s Germany or in the 1480s in Spain? <laughs> and therefore, the analogy to try to understand who we are through comparison to other Jewish communities in the past sometimes leave us incapable of actually assessing what we are doing in the present without inviting the specter of fear of what may happen to us in the future. Another way of asking the question of what our great contribution to history could be or should be is to ask the question derisively as it is oftentimes asked by non-American Jews who understand the American Jewish community to be inferior. That's oftentimes the commentary about the American Jewish community is, look how weak it is by means of describing, I don't know, cultural output, American Jewish literacy. Do we learn anything about who we are when we examine it only comparatively or derisively? Or you could ask this question, as is increasingly being asked in pages of publications like The Atlantic, suspiciously, rooted in a sense that it is gone or lost. You could ask the question, what did American Jews contribute to history, operating from a sense of fear that it is already frittering away? It's no question that many of us feel that we are struggling in this American Jewish present. I'll come back to this. You see the emergence of this conversation starting from that point. Those who see that something seems to be giving way from a perception that we had a golden age, but sometimes you don't realize you had a golden age until you start noticing that things don't feel quite as golden. Those who believe that we're on the verge of a collapse of the American Jewish project. But I don't want to do that tonight. I actually want to ask the question, what have American Jews contributed to Judaism and Jewish history? I want to ask the question appreciatively. American Jews have built a magnificent Jewish community. One is actually the envy of many other minority groups in this country. A community that is experiencing, as I said, greater affluence, influence, power, and privilege than any other Jewish community in history, in history with the possible exception of the contemporary Jewish community in the state of Israel. American Jews have done so building not just institutions, but an ideology along the way. We've created something here that reflects an amazing story and an amazing accomplishment. The American Jewish community is the Jewish community in the world with a greater sense of continuity, lacking a major rupture than any other Jewish community in the world. I want to pause on that for a second because at some point in the past 20 or 30 years, continuity was a word that elicited American Jewish anxiety. It was rooted in a sense that somehow we were creating discontinuity with the practices of who Jews were marrying or what behaviors of identity we were exhibiting. But if you just look at the map, where did people live and where did they get located or relocated or dislocated in the 20th century? The American Jewish community is a story of radical continuity, a community that has been in one place for hundreds of years and has only increased in size, success, and prominence throughout its duration and history. But beyond that, not just being a continuous Jewish community, not just being a community that has institutions, I want to argue tonight that we have been involved as American Jews, not always consciously, but we have been involved as American Jews in the creation of a remarkable Judaism, and one that will, in fact, involve a major contribution to the history of our people. What we have been doing is forging a Judaism for America, and at the same time, forging an understanding of America in which that very Judaism can thrive. It's amazing that we did this subconsciously, <laughs> but that means that there are two simultaneous, masterful, interpretive processes taking place at the same time redefining Judaism so that it could, could thrive in this environment, and redefining or defining this place in a particular way that it could create hospitable conditions for that Judaism to flourish. 
before we can figure out where our Jewish community is heading, tonight I want to take stock of what we've created. I want to suggest that this Judaism consists of four principles, all premised on a single belief. The first principle of American Judaism that we created and we are contributing to history is that we inherited and then reimagined a framework of sacred geography that imagines the boundary between, or the binary, between homeland and exile. This has been a remarkable accomplishment. The term sacred geography, sacred geography, is the idea in Jewish tradition that the world divides between two places. Homeland, the land of Israel, and exile, or diaspora, which means everywhere else. It's, of course, a ludicrous way to define the world. It's similar to the great division that Jews oftentimes have between there are two types of people in the world, Jews and non-Jews. A ludicrous way for a population of 15 million people to characterize 8 billion. <laughs> Sacred geography is the geographic equivalent. There are two places in the world. Either you're in the land of Israel or you are in miscellaneous. Sacred geography is not really about geography. It's really about time. It imagines when we're going to go from the lesser inferior place, the place you don't want to be, the present land, to the imagined better place, that thing we call the promised land. But here's what American Jews did with that category of sacred geography. Starting in 1948, in the radical decision that American Jews made that defied and bucked the trends of virtually every other Jewish community in the world, and the decision to stay, American Jews redefined the terms of sacred geography in ways that had never been seen before in Jewish history, largely choosing to treat America as home. And in turn, American Jews built a Judaism, a one-of-a-kind modern Jewish identity that could inhabit both belonging here in diaspora and support for Zionism and the state of Israel over there without conflict or contradiction between the two. American Jews looked at the categories of home versus exile and said, I can one-up that. I can have home and homeland at the same time. I can turn diaspora or exile from being negative categories to actually frameworks for belonging. One of the principal thinkers who makes this possible is Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who coins the idea of the possibility of Zionism without dual loyalty at a time when it was politically complicated for him to make such an argument. Brandeis wanted to argue that to belong to a people to be a Zionist made Jews in America more American. It gave us a thicker ethnic identity as opposed to just being random refugees from countries to America that we weren't proud of, places that never quite felt like home. American Jews who felt connected to the Jewish people through the prospect of Zionism and what would become the state of Israel would become tethered proudly to a land of our distant ancestors. Mordechai Kaplan takes Brandeis' idea and elevates it to something else. He changes the language from Zionism to peoplehood, and that sticks. Ever since, we have seen the ways in which Jewish peoplehood offers American Jews the dignity, the majesty, of belonging to something bigger than ourselves that doesn't define our Jewish identity entirely through the boundaries of this particular country. We don't just have to be American Jews, we get to be Americans and Jews. We get to benefit from belonging to a particular place and belonging to the Jewish people. It means that our Jewishness, in this radical way of thinking about belonging, is bigger than the local. Yes, I'm a Bay Area Jew, I'm a Baltimore Jew, but I actually belong to something bigger than my local identity or my local community. Peoplehood prevents Jewish identity from become, becoming fully atomized to the individual. That's a trend and a tendency of modern identities, that we build our worlds entirely around ourselves. And peoplehood invites us to transcend that, allows us to feel connected, implicated, and shaped by the bigger story of our people, especially as the story of the Jewish people was being reinvented in Palestine and then in the state of Israel. 
Jewish people it has always been one of the most radical ideas of the Jewish tradition. It's a radical idea that says you can be a nation made up of subgroups. You can call those tribes or sects or denominations and you can actually thrive with both of those. You can belong to a subgroup and you can belong to the whole and those things, even though they seem that they are in tension with each other, are actually ways of thinking about reinforcing one another. We are a collective that has always preserved the unique sub-identities of Jewish life that even conflict with one another. We believe that Jewish peoplehood persists in spite of the fact that we do not agree with one another, that we share no geography, that we constitute people that come from different racial, ethnic, and other backgrounds. We don't even believe the same things about Judaism. And nevertheless, we belong to something bigger than ourselves. Peoplehood may be teetering right now in America, but we, at least in the 20th century, made it something real, and we made it something remarkable. One contribution we as Jews in America made to Jewish history was that we shattered the notion that sacred geography means homeland and exile and introduced the possibility that sacred geography could mean home and homeland at the same time. Even if it's teetering now, we might have even through this framework of Jewish peoplehood broken new ground conceptually for other Americans, for all Americans, who are struggling with a very idea that I can belong to something and feel a sense of loyalty and membership to that same collective, even if I think that they are wrong on everything. What, what, for other Americans, the idea of Jewish peoplehood is a gateway to the possibility of the kinds of pluralism, how a thick religious and ethnic identity like the one that American Jews created in America could create the possibility of what Rabbi Sachs called the dignity of difference. That is the first great contribution that Jews made in America to Judaism and Jewish history. The second great contribution that Jews in America make to Judaism and Jewish history is that we, in embracing America as a place of individual striving, as a place of opportunity, that America wants to think of itself as the place for self-actualization, that standing here in Berkeley America imagines that's one of its core myths that a person leaves their household, but unlike what the book of Genesis says, which is you just leave and go to a different household, you leave your household and go west. In embracing that idea, American Jews elevated a core set of ideas from Jewish tradition to make sense in this milieu, the core liberal Jewish ideas from our tradition of radical human equality and autonomy. We took the idea, the teaching, that all humans were created in the image of God, and we turned that into an ideology about self-flourishing. It's a wedding together of a kernel of a Jewish idea that attached to an American vision of itself about the individual, the importance of the individual and self-actualization, becomes the perfect Torah to teach in a country that believes in self-actualization and the idea of going west. We paved the way to a Judaism in that same process. If you believe that all human beings are created in the image of God, we broke new ground as a people, erasing essential differences between Jews and Gentiles as part of that same liberal commitment. Once upon a time in America, not that long ago, both Americans who were non-Jews and Jews who were Americans understood, took for granted, that there was some essential difference between Jews and Gentiles. And it was a boundary that was policed on both ends. And that has largely dissipated and disappeared, except with the anti-Semites, although they're a complicated story today. We took a double curation. We imagined a story of America that was about the flourishing of the individual, we made that essential to how we understood America, and then we curated the ideas from our tradition about radical human autonomy and equality and centered those as essential American Jewish commitments. In doing so, we also rejected the notion that Judaism, as was imagined by almost every other diaspora community in history, had to remain something of a private exercise and we said Judaism gets to be out there together with everyone else in public. 
the second massive idea, the idea that human beings are created in the image of God as not just, I don't know, a thing that it says in the book of Genesis, but as actually a doctrine for human self-actualization by Jews is a massive contribution that American Jews have made to Jewish history. The third big idea, the third principle, the third great contribution is that because America is big, and America is in fact big, because America is big, we American Jews built a Judaism that argued that America should be big and should aim big. Jews in Jewish history have always understood that ideas like uh, the ideas from our tradition about caring for the vulnerable are important. After all, of all of the mitzvot, all of the obligations listed in the Torah, the one that's listed the most is, to caring, is about caring for the vulnerable. American Jews took that idea and said, that's not big enough. What we did is we said, actually, the single value that American Jews consider more important than any others is not taking care merely of the needy, but repairing the world. <laughs> This is like an idea that could only have emerged in a framework of American exceptionalism. We American Jews took America's vision for itself as a big country, not just responsible for its own, but responsible for the world, and we turned it into Jewish language. Caring for the needy in our midst feels too small. What if you could like fix poverty? It's, it's a laugh line, right? I mean, but. That's what repairing the world is about. It's like the most ambitious way of thinking about Judaism in, with an audacity that most Jews in Jewish history would never have considered possible. We American Jews sought to do something so majestic and transformative that could only be imagined if you lived in an empire and called it home. And that's what American Judaism basically did. It saw itself as part of an empire that could fix the world. We saw ourselves as stakeholders of that empire and wanted to leverage that empire for good. By the way, it's no coincidence that American Jews didn't merely dream big through our values of what Judaism was supposed to be about, but we built big also. Buildings, synagogues that are extraordinary in their size and scope, that are like audacious in the way that they take over neighborhoods. We built a massive communal infrastructure that no other minority group in the country can claim. One day I hope that this building big is understood as a belief in presence, as a belief in responsibility, a sense of pride of what we think could be possible, the good kind of pride, not the hubris. One day I hope this is understood, this dreaming big for Judaism in America, is understood that we as American Jews found this massive canvas called America in which we sought to project all of our aspirations and our dreams in the hope of publicly sanctifying the name of God. Maybe that's what we were doing here. We saw it was possible to do something bigger and bolder through the framework of Jewish ideas and Jewish values that no other Jewish community could have had the audacity to do. And the fourth big principle that I believe has emerged from our experience of Jews in America for Jewish history is that we understood America to be, and here I'm quoting both Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, two of the leading lights of American Orthodox Judaism. We understood America to be, quote, a kingdom of kindness. Malchut shel chesed. When these two rabbis describe America as a kingdom of kindness, they are explicitly contrasting America to Rome. Because throughout the rabbinic tradition, Rome is referred to as Malchut HaRasha, the wicked empire, the wicked kingdom. And Schneerson and Feinstein come along and say, actually, America is the opposite. It is a Malchut Shel Chesed. Feinstein and Schneerson were arguing that America was basically good to the Jews and therefore deserving of our gratitude. That is a bold idea about the relationship between identity and place. A place that was good to the Jews and therefore deserving of our gratitude. And what's amazing is that both Schneerson 
and Feinstein take that story of good to the Jews, and they don't say that makes us entitled as American Jews. They say that makes us obligated as American Jews to perform obligations of civic responsibility and belonging. Feinstein in 1980s was asked by the JCRC of New York to write a letter to the Orthodox Jews in the New York area telling them to register to vote and to vote. Now, because of the way in which ultra-Orthodoxy works in the state of Israel, you don't have to convince ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel to go out and vote. <laughs> Their rabbis tell them who to vote for. <laughs> Feinstein does something amazing. He says, he issues a public comment and says, because America is a malchut shel chesed, because America is a kingdom of kindness, it is obligated on Jews to register to vote and vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. But it is a debt of obligation that emerges from what this country represents to American Jews. We were meant to understand our civic responsibilities as religious obligations. American Jews, by and large, have prayed for its government out of sincerity, not out of fear. For much of history, as God was obviously made famous by Fiddler on the Roof, right? Why do we pray for the Tsar? To keep him far away from us. Um, much of prayers that Jews prayed on behalf of foreign governments were rooted in fear. For American Jews, oftentimes rooted in sincerity. We American Jews participated in its political culture as insiders rather than outsiders. In the rabbinic tradition, they describe the Jews who served the Jewish community by becoming adjacent to the Roman authorities. And what they had to do is cut their hair in a particular style, isolate and alienate themselves from the rest of the Jewish community, speak a different language. They had to be what comes to be known as shtadlanim, people who are intermediaries, intercessories on behalf of these powerful others. That's not how American Jews imagined our political culture. We imagined our responsibilities as insiders rather than outsiders, from the shtadlan to grateful members of the system. And what's most extraordinary is that American Jews committed to helping other Americans and America itself aspire to think of itself as a kingdom of kindness. You have the words of perhaps our greatest American Jewish poet, Emma Lazarus, whose vision of America as it appears on the Statue of Liberty almost sounds like a biblical phrase. Her phrase, you're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses yearning to breathe free, which are effectively the American equivalent of the Bible's widow, orphan, and stranger. American Jews, it is no coincidence, play a role in helping America to imagine itself as a place that is a kingdom of kindness. Four key principles that American Jews contribute to Judaism and Jewish history. Peoplehood and the possibility of home and homeland. The idea that, Jews are that human beings are all created in the image of God and therefore Judaism has to be something that, um, it, that is a discourse for self-actualization and pursuit of the individual and the breakdown of the boundary between Jew and Gentile. The idea that we should be big and dream big, that Jews can repair the world and that we live in a place that is a kingdom of kindness. I want to see these as core principles, gifts that Jews have given Judaism and Jewish history, the things that maybe our descendants will be proud of. But all of this was premised on a belief. And that basic belief was that we tended to construe America as a place that was rooted in a covenant. What I mean by this is, not that America is fundamentally good. The idea of the promise of America is not defined by its success or failure. After all, America has not been good to everybody. And it certainly has not been good to everybody equally. But when you think of your relationship to America through a covenantal framework, we're reminded of a moment that takes place in the book of Exodus. God has given the covenant and the, and the Torah to the Jewish people. Immediately, the Jewish people screw it up, and they worship the golden calf. God's impulse is to destroy them until Moses reminds God, no, no, there's a deal here. The deal here is called the covenant. We're going to fail, and you don't get to kill us. And the reason this is significant is because you never measure the success of the promise 
by whether or not it's actually working. You merely ask, what do I need to do to believe in it to make it work? You never hold it accountable to its failures as the end of the story. You ask yourself over and over, what is my responsibility supposed to be to make this system be what it is supposed to be? I was at my friend Ethan Tucker's uh, shiva this week for his uh, stepfather, uh, Senator Joe Lieberman of blessed memory. And he quoted something. And he said, Ethan said something to me that I will never forget. Um, he, said, he said, Joe Lieberman believed in America unironically. I love that line. <laughs> become so, um, <laughs> We become so, so cynical about the notion that a person would believe in America that it sounds like foolishness, but it actually, to me, when he said it, sounded like covenant. It's never been what it is supposed to be. It has never been what Emma Lazarus wanted it to be. But the fundamental belief that animated all of the production of a Judaism by American Jews that would thrive in America was the belief in the possibility that America could be the best version of itself. It has a story it seeks to tell, and our job, as has always been the case for Jews, is to close the gap between the world that we want and the world that we have, and I have the raw materials. America describes this as its vision for itself. Our job is to stand in that breach. What did we do here as a result as American Jews? If this is right, if we've actually contributed lofty ideas to the Jewish tradition, that did not fully emerge in other diasporas, that aren't fully captured by the incredible story of Zionism and what it achieved in the state of Israel, that represent breaking new ground. What we ultimately did is we weaved together a whole set of big commitments. We, we wove together ideals of liberalism, a relationship with Zionism, and an interpretive process to create a set of principles that become something that I want to call even a common Judaism. The common Judaism of American Jews has never been, and will never, been, will never be, what we pray, who we marry, what we eat. Frankly, most of those decisions could take place equally in any other diaspora. The common Judaism that has been a part of the American Jewish project is the willingness to live in these kinds of big ideas and to put something out into the world that represents something bigger and loftier than was imaginable under different conditions. The good news and the bad news. The good news is that this story emerges because this reason this worked was because the American Jewish project thrived through the second half of the 20th century in what we might call greenhouse conditions. All of these American Jewish ideas and values aligned themselves pretty well with the American moment. Post-Cold War liberalism, a story of a kind of American emergence from the Second World War. All of these represented a story that was about an evolving America that enabled all of these values that American Jews put to put forward to be consonant with, consistent with, their own emergence, our own emergence within the American context, none of them at all countercultural to America itself. It worked really well. If American Jews are intertwining values of liberalism that are considered commonplace among other Americans into our Judaism, we're doing a powerful job of interpreting our own tradition in a way that makes it feel common sense to the world that's around us. What's been taking place over the past 30 years is that there are ideological evolutions underway here in America. These are implicating Jews as well, and all of these values are starting to look strange. All of these principles sound like relics of a previous time in American Jewish history. Something is changing in this atmosphere. Something has shifted in the terrain. I referenced implicitly Franklin Foer's Atlanticus essay about American Jewish golden ages ending. I think I had the title for this lecture before that article came out, but no one will ever believe me um, that I used the title <laughs> golden age also. Uh, and the witnessing of forms of anti-Semitism 
and a ubiquity of anti-Semitism that many of us as American Jews have never quite experienced. What I think is basically happening is that the biggest erosion taking place for American Jews is not actually about those principles that I said before, but about the fundamental belief in America on which those principles basically stand, which is being assaulted from both the right and the left. The mythic nostalgia of Trumpism, which claims that there was some great golden period of time when we know that America was never quite as good as that imagined, and the same time, a critique that is emerging from the left saying that it never happened and therefore was a lie, are both simultaneously assaults on this Jewish essential idea that we have to be in covenantal relationship to the possibility of America. Both of these are squeezing that story and making it sound naive, 20th century, and not nearly as occurrent as the current ideological trends. American Jews, I find, to our great discredit, are actually participating in the ideological shifts taking place in America. And the reason we're doing that is because we are just like Ameri other Americans, because assimilation works. But what it's doing is it's coming at the cost of these very essential Jewish ideas that emerged and constitute our great gift to history. In turn, by disbelieving that core idea about what we could produce here as Jews in America, by, being, by moving away from the notion that our job is not to merely indict America, but to hold it accountable to what it's supposed to be, by, by shifting our narrative about what America is about, we are essentially allowing our different Judaisms to map onto totally different political theories about America that are in open competition with one another. We are eroding our capacity to fight anti-Semitism and worst of all, we are taking these core Jewish ideas and making them see, seem naive and impossible. My goal tonight is not merely to tell a story about the future that imagines our past. I would hate to think that the relic of this lecture in history was figuring out something about America and American Judaism right before it gave way to something else. The goal of a lecture like tonight is to ask if our goal is to actually continue to thrive on the basis of these values into the future, if they've served us powerfully for a long time, what must we as American Jews do to sustain them? And I'm, I'm afraid that the answer is weirdly simple. Once upon, these, once upon a time, these values emerged precisely because they reflected a consistency with the surrounding culture. They came about because they were part of the process by which American Judaism were assimilating our tradition into what America was. And now the basic problem that we have is that these same ideas sound countercultural. American Jews have never been great at being a counterculture. Even American Jews who participated in the countercultures of the 1960s did so because it was kind of a dominant trend. <laughs> We have never been particularly good at saying that to be committed to Judaism is to be committed to something countercultural to the emerging ideological trends of this country. We are so great at assimilation. And I, I say that not insultingly. It's a, it's a hard thing to do. The incredible skills of being able to assimilate, accommodate, and acculturate to different environments is a fantastic tool that American Jews, like Jews throughout history, have done as a means of survival and thriving. And in the 20th century, it produced a magnificent Judaism. And now that Judaism appears to be more of a counterculture to an American environment that is skeptical of the belief in America that once made this possible, and deeply skeptical to those very liberal values that are essential to the forge of that Judaism. If you no longer have greenhouse conditions, you have to stop assuming that the conditions that produce a Judaism will simply come about. You have to make your commitments and your beliefs more plain. I am not sure it is going to be possible for American Jews to be as countercultural as I think we need to be. It is countercultural to even use the term today in America, a common Judaism where we share values together with people we disagree with. Americans, by and large, are deciding that their commitments 
to their political viewpoints are far more significant than their commitments to their fellow Americans, and Jews are in turn doing the same thing. There are a lot of different possibilities and necessities for how American Jews might respond to this moment, but I want to argue tonight that the project for American Judaism has to at least, at least a piece of it, has to be ideological. Our community is always going to think in terms of projects and programs. We're going to think in terms of institutions and social change. But a piece of the work has to be here. It has to be the willingness to say, what are the things that we are doing which create our Judaism, and what will it take to preserve that Judaism? Not to be an, a relic of a historical moment that one time in the past we say, well, that Judaism lasted for 100 years and was replaced by something else, but because there's actually majesty and magnificence that many of us have seen personally and experienced through the production of this Judaism for Jewish history. We are burdened by institutional questions, but a big piece of the work is ideological. And the good news is that many of the best Jewish books ever written don't really have an end. The Talmud is the best example, is the record of conversations, and it doesn't mean that you can't notice within the Talmud a set of immense ideological commitments that characterized Babylonian Jewry and were its great contributions to history. The good news for American Jews is that if my hypothesis tonight about these values is correct, much of the hard work of defining American Judaism has already been done for us. We've inherited incredible principles and a powerful belief. Our job for the next generation is to figure out how to make that Judaism continue to thrive. Thank you very much. I have so much kind of dancing around in my head uh, that I don't even know where to have an entry point. Um, as an Orthodox Jew in Berkeley, <laughs> as a Shabbat observant Jew in Berkeley, I love the embrace of being countercultural. Um, I think it's a, an extraordinary prescription um, and one that really drives a commitment. Um, let me push back on, or, or kind of push in uh, on, on a question. The story you tell says that um, American Jewry came up with, through four principles, this extraordinary gift to history, this great gift to history, you called it. Um, and those principles are extraordinary principles. And the danger now, one way of understanding what you're saying is the danger now is that, uh, the way you described it, I tried to write it down, um, we're losing this because folks are mapping their Judaism on a whole range of different arguments and ideas that are different from the basic underlying principle that allowed those four great gifts to history. And so uh, maybe Judaism, what we call Judaism is being more fractured or you know, where's the Judaism in all of that thing? We find something we like and we call it, this is our Judaism. Um, but if you take that back a step, I, I guess I'll ask you, why wasn't that what American Jews were doing in coming up with these four new ideas, these gifts to history in the first place? Like what was really Jewish about it? What was really Jewish about the process of sorting those ideas? About this legacy that you're afraid we're going to lose, the four principles. What's Jewish about the four principles that's different from Judaism as uh, this or that contemporary idea now? Well, it is, po it is altogether possible that a fractured partisan version of Judaism, which we are on the verge of basically embodying in America, in which by and large Jewish commitments are simply kind of proof texts that are, that are 
sprinkled atop existing political commitments, <laughs> that may also wind up being a contribution to Jewish history. I think it's gonna be a really bad one and an unpleasant one to live through. <laughs> um, and part of that is because you are gonna lose the connective tissue that Jews have to one another, which was principle number one. The sense of our capacity to belong to something bigger than the, than the limit of our particular idiosyncratic beliefs. So I, I, at the fear of being a little bit circular, that commitment is a, is a novel one. It's actually an extraordinary one. The very peoplehood commitment is an extraordinary one, and it was only made possible, we know, because following the, the Holocaust and with the emergence of the State of Israel, it felt like there was a central project for Jews to participate in. But we took those historical conditions and wind up creating an ideological infrastructure, a piece of ideology as a result, that actually then feels like it holds it common. Is it possible that the future of Judaism in America is the diminishment of the possibility of common Judaism? Yeah, I think that is very possible. And I, listen, maybe, our, maybe that will be what our future descendants as historians will say. This was the transition from a moment of common Judaism to fracture Judaism. And for those who are scholars who don't care about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that too will be interesting. <laughs> and it will also be a story of Jewish history. I just think it will have reflected a loss in the same way that at any other time in Jewish history, if you had something that was an important ideological contribution to history and Jews replaced it with something else, you would say something got lost along the way. What I think is the other layer on it is that I think many of us feel, I'll speak personally, that it's not, I'm not agnostic about the trade of one for the other. I think one is better. <laughs> and I think we gotta be willing to say it's a better version. It, it, stre it, it stretches us morally. When we describe ourselves as being bound to a collective that is bigger than our particular commitments, it stretches us more morally than when Judaism always lines up exactly with what I was going to say anyway. It makes a demand of us. And I, I so yes, are other options Jewish also? Yes. I just think that it worse. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll come back with another question here, but I just wanted to say that um, uh, Yudas volunteered very graciously to also engage with uh, folks in the audience and answer questions. Um, as always, students get first priority, but uh, there's probably time for a whole bunch of people, so think about things that you might want to ask. So uh, one, one thing that your talk also made me think of is um, Lior Batnitsky at, uh, at Princeton um, writes a book uh, and teaches and talks a lot about the, the question of kind of what Judaism is. Um, at one time in, in a pre-enlightenment time, Judaism was just a life. You know, you, uh, you were a Jew and you did prayers, and you ate with other Jews, and you lived with other Jews, and you lived your life, and it, that's what it was. Post-enlightenment, kind of that unity of existence was kind of fractured. Um, and, you know, some Jews did their Judaism in one way, through religious prayer, others did it through culture, uh, others did it through ethnic identity. Lior writes a book um, when Judaism became a religion, uh, which talks about the ways that kind of uh, Western society imposed a kind of Protestant notion on what Judaism was. It's a religion like Protestantism. That's all it is. It's not this coherent, comprehensive sense, um, which is why a lot of folks' interaction with what Judaism is, is, is wrong. It just doesn't kind of understand it. Um, was American Judaism kind of, uh, what, what did it end up being in your tale? Uh, a culture, a, uh, an ethnicity, you use the term nation and people. Yeah, I, I would say that by describing these as four, as four principles, one of which is clearly traffics in the language of religion, right? To say that, for instance, that Judaism contributes a notion that 
the central idea of Jewish tradition is that human beings are created in the image of God, which leads me to two incredible conclusions. One, that I matter, which is a great thing to teach in America, that I matter, and also that you and I are fundamentally equal, which is an incredible legacy of the capacity of Jews to break down the boundaries between ourselves and others. That is an idea that imagines Jewishness as a font for religious ideas, religious ideas that then define me, they are, they are um, their deep beliefs. And at the same time, I, have a, I, think, I think you can't separate, the first principle is a description of Judaism as an ethnos, as a nation, as a people, as a collective, that somehow managed to hold together that, that commitment itself reflexively as a piece of what American Jews felt was supposed to be important. The best paradox of this finds its place in the 1950s when um, the late Jonathan Wucher writes about this extensively where he says, in the 1950s, American Jews believed in God less than they do today. Hard to believe because on every study of American Jews compared to other religions, American Jews believe in God the least. Um, uh, as my, my teacher Michael Paley often says, American Jews, uh, Jew, he says Jews are the people who believe in one God or less. Um, so what is it, so here's the weird thing. American Jews, American Jews in the 1950s believe in God less than they do today, but they go to synagogue more. By, by like huge margins. They belong to synagogue and show up every week. You know, what Wucher basically said is because the civil religion for American Jews in the 1950s, you had to belong to a synagogue partly because you had to show other Americans that you weren't the only thing worse than being a Jew, which was being an atheist, right? A non-churched person. So you had to belong to something. And therefore, they had to fill the synagogues with the content that would make it be something of value. And what was the thing that filled the synagogues? Israel bonds and fighting anti-Semitism, which were ultimately secular national commitments. That's a good illustration of the paradox of American Jewish identity. We're using the framework of religion, the infrastructure of religion, the language of key belief systems to actually fill that with what are basically secular national commitments. The answer to the question is American Jews are not, uh, Judaism is not like any of these other categories. It doesn't work when you try to Protestantize it too much. It strips away some core elements of what we have insisted about our identity, which is not what Christian hegemony wants our identity to be. And when, and, and the reverse is also true. When we make it entirely a secular national identity and strip away the moral aspirations of our tradition, then it's just a nation like all other nations and it can't make a claim, as Judaism has tried to make, of an exceptionalism. And the good kind of exceptionalism is not the one where you say you're better than other people. The good kind of exceptionalism is the one where you say, I have a standard for myself that I'm trying to hold myself accountable to. So, yeah, does it fit in any box? No. That's why it's unusual, and maybe that's why it could only accommodate 15 million people at a time. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's hard to scale. I love it. Um, uh, I see a hand way in the back. Go ahead. I'm Berkeley. I'm a member of Nitiba Shalom in Berkeley. And I listened to you talking on his webinars. So my question is, you're talking about the moral, ethical, how? We have two countries fighting for democracy right now. And I'm thinking about this an awful lot because of the rise of anti-Semitism. How can our Judaism and democracy, I'd like to hear you speak about this. What's the connection between Judaism and democracy and preserving it both there in Israel and here? And how does it influence our Judaism? Great. Um, a lot of what I talked about tonight, especially around the notion of believing in a country covenantally, is the same thing that you would describe as the, the core commitment of liberal Zionism. Liberal Zionism basically says, I have a story of what I'm trying to do with this country, which is to be a nation state of the Jewish people that is both a state of the Jews and a state for all of its citizens, a state that believes genuinely that it can be both a Jewish state and a democracy, um, and that recognizes that if it is not there yet, then I have a lot of work to do. That always sees itself as hopefully not the Sisyphean thing that you're pushing it uphill and you never get there, 
but sees its responsibility to hold our countries, the ones that we love, accountable to the vision of itself that they've advanced in their declarations of independence, both America and Israel, and the constitutional stuff of Israel and the constitution that's here. Um, the critics of that kind of way of thinking about politics will say, America at its founding claimed to believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everyone. It was a lie. It was obviously only for a certain segment of the population, and since it was a lie, it needs to be radically unmade. That is the equivalent of the criticism of the State of Israel today, which says, you are not actually a full Jewish and democratic state. You are Jewish and not fully democratic. Therefore, you are perpetuating a lie about yourself, and the only alternative is to unmake it. Both the liberal Zionist position and the version of America that I'm talking about think differently. They think about covenantal responsibility to the values that we hold dear. Now, I didn't say tonight Judaism and democracy as one great contribution of American Jews to Jewish history. I didn't say that for two reasons. One is, that's also the main project that Israelis are trying to contribute to Judaism. And we hope they succeed. To wed principles of Jewish tradition to democratic principles in ways that are morally serious, accountable to the highest aspirations, and actually produce a functional country. But I hope you did notice that democratic principles run through a lot of what I talked about tonight as the Judaism that I want American Jews to aspire to, including the basic liberal principles of autonomy and equality. Those are also democratic principles. I'm very worried, especially in America, that when we talk about the wedding of Jewish and democratic principles, what that sounds to people is Judaism and the Democratic Party. Because that is a long-term loser. You may think that that's the right party. That is a long-term loser to the continued polarization of Jews away from thinking of ourselves as collectively responsible for something and instead into a more partisan position. And I think even though you may feel today, as I often do, that the party I vote for is really a democracy party and the one, other one is tearing down democracy, the long term, the only way a country stays a democracy in the long term is if, it does, if the two political parties are not trying to destroy each other. If they're only trying to basically win elections in ways that keep everybody alive. That is an uncomfortable reality of democracy. Democracy is supposed to be um, highly competitive and stop at, at violence. <laughs> And we are at the precipice of something giving way that requires, that may, for us, many of us say, well, that means our side needs to win. But it also has to be a kind of a larger constraint on making sure that we're not inadvertently participating in the same culture that's going to bring about the demise of Judaism and democracy in this country. Um, I, I didn't know exactly in advance what you were going to talk about. And I'm just, I'm really taken by your four principles, and, I, and they're really resonating with me as I sit with them. I just want to say, like, I love this notion of, you know, caring for the poor in your communities. Not, not big, it's not an American Jewish idea. Tikkun olam, that's an American Jewish idea. Um, and I think that's right. What happens, I think you started to go there a little, what happens when we say, OK, this is an extraordinary American Jewish accomplishment, an American Jewish gift. And we've identified these things. And it's an amazing melding of Jewish principles and this moment and this time. But then everyone says, we're not interested anymore. So peoplehood is ethnocentrism. We're not interested in that. I'm talking about non-Jews. If we say this is our contribution uh, to history, right? And Americans say, we're not interested in ethnocentrism. Um, Self-actualization, that's uh, kind of greed and narcissism. We've rejected that. Um, be big and think big, that's like colonialism and capitalism. We reject that. Uh, kingdom of kindness, I'm not sure exactly what to do with that one, but uh, <laughs> I, was, I was on a roll. Um, uh, how much can counterculturalism, I mean, work in the face of that? 
The truth is, I, to be honest, I don't think we've even tried yet. I, you know, I've been trying to figure this out for a long time and, <laughs> and trying to tease out this question of what have we learned and what is a, what, it, what, do, what does American Judaism mean? <laughs> and the fact that like, I do this for a living and I can't, there's not a lot being written or talked about, about like, what does American Judaism mean? There's vastly less public and private conversation about the meaning of American Judaism among American Jews than there is about Zionism as an ideological movement of, of, Jew, of the Jewish people in the 20th century. So I don't think we've even started to articulate these and then turn them into something of an educational program where we build a community that actually takes pride in what Judaism is about. In fact, it's so startling to me that I hear this weird thing a lot from people of like, when am I, well, I guess, I guess this place is over, it's time to pack up and leave. So I'm like, first of all, that's not really happening. But second of all, wait, I, if you really see yourself building something, then you're accountable to it in the long, like for a much longer way than, than just like, oh, well, I guess, it's, I guess it's the same as every other diaspora in history, which is it reaches an inauspicious end. If we actually name these as principles that we wanna say are really serious and we've inherited them for multiple generations already and we've been building them like a majestic tower. We've built something extraordinary here. What would that do to our mindset of not being as worried about the fact that they are less popular and actually turn them into an engine of the Jewish people's un deeper understanding that we are engaged in an actual project of something, that we're doing something here. I, the, the bigger thing that, I, that frightens me a little bit is whether we're in an anti-ideological moment, whether people are replacing big ideological commitments with political commitments, which I find to be much thinner. That's a little bit scary to me, but I, I kind of feel like in general, and here's a critique, my our, a critique of the Jewish community doesn't really even try to say, what do we care about? What do we believe in? We teach a lot of stuff, Jewish stuff, but a kind of essentialist exercise, this is what we're basically about, then once we know it, let's see whether it holds up against those critic criticism. Because I, I think if it's good, like I believe in the marketplace of ideas, if it's good, we can win. If you put your effort behind it, if we, but if we've just named it and we're anxious that it's gonna disappear because of the ideological trends, we're not actually committing to saying that there's something very serious at stake in our Jewishness here. I'll give you like a weird case, a case of this. Um, this was the moment, this was a moment in 20, I don't know where it was, it was during, must have been during Obama's second term. When was that? 2012 to 20, sometime between 2012 and 2016. And I was invited, as I'm sometimes invited, to these very weird political receptions by politicians for Jews. They're one of the strangest environments. And I was at, I was at Joe Biden's house, which was the, the vice president's mansion, for like a week before Rosh Hashanah. And it was like a reception for the Jewish community. And Biden told the story that he has always told all the time. It's always the same story. When did he realize, you know, when did he get convinced to be a Zionist, basically? It was the Golda Meir story. It's a bunch of people in this room. I know you know the story, which is, um, you know, Golda Meir says to Biden when he's a senator, junior senator, um, we're, this is, we're never gonna leave, we're, you know, this is never, this project, the state of Israel is never gonna fail. And he says, why is that? And Golda Meir says to him, because we have nowhere to go. And he says, that's, I'm with you. And I stood there, I'm a Jew, invited to the home of the Vice President of the United States. And I'm like, what do you mean nowhere to go? I'm, 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 I'm here. Why is it so, why, why in the eyes of the most powerful Americans is the story of Jewish homeland so much more obvious to articulate for Jews in Israel than it is for American Jews. And I blame us. <laughs> I blame us because we haven't, we haven't told people what we're doing here. <laughs> we haven't made that bold claim for ourselves. So I know why he tells that story. I know the crowd, there's a pro-Israel crowd. It plays great. <laughs> But I think it sits on us, and so I'm not worried yet about whether the ideological trends are moving the other direction. I am worried that it has to be a counterculture, but the first piece is like, at least name it to be a culture. Over this next year, think about if you want to be the type of Jew that turned inward 
and focuses on like building Jewish community inward or outward, and building Jewish community like as part of America. And he, you know, as a normal guy, I didn't give an answer. <laughs> I'm curious, um, how would you break down the percentage? Like, what do you think? What percentage of the time could we be building inward? percentage outward and as we become more counterculture should those percentages change in what way? Great. Um, six days a week we work. <laughs> That's an, actually an honest answer. I actually think there's something to that that our tradition actually bakes in. How much is the hundreds divided by seven? Fourteen percent? <laughs> our tradition bakes in fourteen percent of time that is entirely about family and Jewish community and then invites us to be participants in the world. That's a pretty good reading of the book, of the, of the creation of the world in the book of Genesis. Um, but what does that really mean? So uh, if we as American Jews are worried that the conditions that created the possibility for us to thrive are eroding, and there's good reason to believe that. You know, um, the conditions that sustained a kind of post-war liberalism in America are really struggling. You get the good index on this that the three key institutions of American Cold War liberalism that were trusted by both sides of the political aisle and thought of as the infrastructure that sustained a basic sanity in America, those three institutions were uh, a government that was considered trustworthy by the people, especially the Supreme Court, so far 0 for 1, um, a free, fair, and independent media that was trusted by the people, 0 for 2, and the universities. <laughs> um, those are, the home, those are the institutions that create the forge for a strong liberal culture that then Jews can thrive in. Uh, we're watching all of those three eroding under the current, in the current uh, atmosphere, and that's creating the pressure on the capacity of the Jewish community to continue to flourish in the same way. Our job as a Jewish community should be, very obviously, what do we need to do to build up those key institutions in American life? That's our, if we know, like we, it's all there, you, you know exactly what were the conditions that made us thrive, we have to work on that. The inward turn is doubly problematic because not only are you not engaging in that work, in the, in the, very, in, in the same kind of work that helped you thrive for a long time, but, of turning, but abandoning the, the larger liberal project not only weakens our position, but it weakens our capacity to build relationships with others um, towards, that, towards that process. So, um, yeah, I, so I'll, I'll, st I'll stick with that, six to one, right? I would, and by the way, those are Jew that has to be understood as Jewish commitments. Jewish commitments of being responsible to the American public square are not, it doesn't divide like here's when I'm Jewish and here's when I'm American. It's all of these are American Jewish commitments. Some of them are meant to actually build the society in which we can thrive, and some of them are American Jewish commitments that build us up to be able to withstand the difficulty of the moment. Um, and I'm curious, first of all, do you think that um, the kind of erosion of the common Judaism is like partially a consequence of assimilation? And then what do you think the sort of the balance is between the fear of assimilation and then the dangers that come with fearing assimilation uh, too much? Yeah. Assimilation is such a funny thing for Jews because there's it's like one of those things, you know, people are like, anyone who's to the left of me is a communist and anyone to the right of me is a fascist. So that's the same thing with assimilation. There's, it's always like a little bit off. <laughs> There's no kind of perfect stopping point. Assimilating just enough to be able to sustain Jewish identity, but not um, just enough, it, it stops just short so you sustain a Jewish identity, but it goes far enough that you're not like just a, a schleppy, unassimilated Jew, right? So it can't, it, there's like, it's, it's like a totally imperfect thing. Um, my own thinking on assimilation changed a lot by reading a really, really important essay by uh, the late chancellor of the seminary, Gerson Cohen. The, the essay is called The Blessing of Assimilation in Jewish History. And he was pushing against what was already beginning to be a dominant threat of American Jews, which used the term assimilation as a boogeyman. Um, and he said, actually, no, assimilation is the very mechanism of Jewish survival. <laughs> It's the way in which we didn't remain weird outsiders in all of these places. And by the way, it's the way in which Judaism changes over a 3,000 year period to be like 
the cultic rituals of a nomadic people to being like a really interesting post-enlightenment religion. <laughs> Doesn't happen without assimilation. We didn't make that stuff up on our own. Um, so that, just the mindset of assimilation is not really the problem, it's the mechanism, um, already is a, is a sea change. Is it possible that some of what's happened today, that American Jews have just continued on the assimilation train, so just as Americans have become hyper-polarized and hyper-partisanized, American Jews have done the same thing? Yes. That's where I'm looking for a little bit of the countercultural push of saying that comes at too much of a loss. Now, American Jews believe, like many other Americans, that they gain more by winning. And that might be true for other Americans, although I think there's something at, at, that's at risk for Americans themselves. But it's particularly dangerous for American Jews to participate in that process. And I'll give you one other example, if I can, which is just the anti-Semitism piece itself. What happened to our capacity to fight anti-Semitism as a Jewish community is that by participating in hyper-partisanship in this country, we have basically created a situation where if you vote for the Democratic Party, the anti-Semites who you want to fight the most are in the Republican Party. And if you vote for the Republican Party, the anti-Semites who you think are the real problem are in the Democratic Party. And the minute that that happens, if you are only trying to defeat anti-Semitism on the other side of the political aisle, you are not fighting anti-Semitism anymore, you're just trying to win elections. And that has, that's the whole move that eroded our capacity to see anti-Semitism as a collective concern that requires collective mobilization. And it's not gonna happen through, we're not gonna fight anti-Semitism on Twitter. We're not gonna fight anti-Semitism by trying to get Kyrie Irving to go to the Holocaust Museum. That, it's totally silly. You could try to identify that hyper-partisanship and polarization is driving the industry of anti-Semitism, and for the Jewish community to be a force that tries to hold that in, at minimum not participating in it, and possibly even trying to persuade the American public that this is not in our, it's our short-term political interest. You'll win on this particular issue, but it's in our long-term collective disinterest. Yehuda, uh, hearing from you is just so interesting. I uh, am grateful and I think all of us value the fact that you would come spend some time with us. Um, thank you so much.